August 11th, 1991. Let's go back to this day one last time. The very first day of the Nicktoons, more or less. In previous reviews, I've made two other journeys back to this monumental date in animation history. One to tackle the breakout hit of the Trinity, The Ren and Stimpy Show. It's good, it's bad, and it's really, really ugly. Then I took a look at Doug. It's a thing that aired on TV. At least it had funny dream sequences and a memorable soundtrack. But there was one more that aired in between. It wasn't as funky as Doug. It wasn't as wild or controversial as Ren and Stimpy. But for a long time, it was Nickelodeon's biggest hit and an inescapable television icon, Rugrats. For those of you born after the year 2000 like myself, this seems odd. I mean, yeah, we caught some episodes, we knew the characters, and we generally considered it a good show, but we were left baffled at how popular it was back in the 90s. It's a show about babies, it couldn't have rocked the mainstream that hard. Well, it did, and we weren't there for it, and I for one always felt like I was missing out on something. And so I miss out on as little as possible in this review format, I'm gonna cover everything. Nine seasons, 172 episodes, three movies, and two specials. I'm not gonna break it up and come back to it next year like with other series I've been intimately familiar with. If this is really one of the biggest cartoons of all time, it has to be treated big. This was actually a pretty exciting cartoon to start my journey through, and I'm happy to document my feelings on every season, and share if I think the show's worth revisiting. I feel like a bright-eyed historian, a lot of this information and subject matter is new to me, and there was so much more to say about this show about babies than I was expecting. The early history of Rugrats is a quick and simple one, but still worth remembering. The three creators include Arlene Klasky and Garba Shupo, who created their own animation studio in the 80s after moving from Hungary to America. Compared to what was being shown on TV at the time, Klasky Shupo's works were warped, stretchy, avant-garde, and very creative. You ain't getting a free pass just yet, Mr. Shupo. Their studio was the one who produced the animated segments on The Tracy Ullman Show from 1987 to 1989, including Doctor and Gitatu by M.K. Brown and The Simpsons by Matt Groening. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. The Tracy Ullman Show is produced by James L. Brooks, whose assistant at the time, Paul Germain, joined Klasky Shupo as a line producer on The Simpsons. You know the rest, the shorts got really popular, a full series was commissioned, the pilot was a disaster, but after that, TV animation was redefined for the 90s. But in 1989, while season 1 was in production, Klasky Shupo and Germain started brainstorming other ideas for cartoons in case The Simpsons failed. One day, Aline Klasky told Paul Germain she wanted to make a show about babies because the staff were becoming parents and she thought it'd be cute. So Paul Germain went home that night and reminisced about when one of his younger brothers first came back from the hospital. He couldn't walk and he couldn't talk. He just sat in his crib fidgeting about. Newborns couldn't be this stupid, Paul thought, and believed that when he and the others left the room, his brother would start walking and talking with ease. By turning that innocent childhood thought into a show pitch, Rugrats was born. Conveniently, in 1989, Nickelodeon was scouting talent for their upcoming brand of original animated programming, which would become the Nicktoons. Of all the ideas Klasky Shupo pitched, this was the most basic one, and the one Nickelodeon was the most enthusiastic about. The eventual produced pilot was one of several they showed around to test audiences in 1990, and it was easily among the most positively received. This is no place for you! Directed by Peter Chung, who would go on to create Eon Flux, Tommy Pickles and the Great White Thing is a fascinating watch. The plot is simple enough, babies are entranced by this magical pearly white device the adults use. It's the textbook definition of a pitch. It sells you the show, babies exploring the world and their parents failing to catch on to their escapades. It sells you the basic setup, what would babies think of a toilet? It sells you on the visual style, albeit in a more exaggerated state than what you're used to, and most importantly, it sells you the characters. Tommy Pickles, the born explorer, voiced here by Tammy Holbrook, who somehow makes him sound younger than he is. Phil and Lil DeVille, the twin brother and sister who argue all the time. They hardly changed going into the series. Spike, the Pickle family's dog, Tommy's faithful steed, and the parents, Stu, Dee Dee, and Grandpa Stu Sr. Their function also didn't change, but the men's names were given a touch-up. 
you know already how successful of a pitch this was, and can notice the many differences between the pilot and full series, the different voices and names, the more surreal and dreamlike animation. I'm writing this section while watching through season 7 and man does it keep looking better. If you don't remember catching this on TV growing up, that's because you didn't. While snippets were used for bumpers early on, the general public wouldn't see it again until it was included on the Decade and Diapers Home videos on August 7th, 2001. It was a nice little bonus there, but I doubt it would have stuck out too hard against the first season. Hey, yo! Down in front! From the very start, the gist of Rugrats is easy to grasp. It follows a group of very young children aged 1 to 3, navigating the world and trying to understand it, and coming to some wrong conclusions, albeit stimulating and exciting ones. Their parents are kind young go-getters who give them some room to explore, but most of the adventures are caused by them having dangerously short attention spans and getting sidetracked from making sure their infant children are safe from harm. I guess part of the reason millennial parents are so protective is that this was what they watched growing up. Pure horror when you think about it. But fun pure horror. Rugrats always had a pretty laid back tone. Not that things couldn't get scary, we'll get there when we get there, but life is slower at this age, the world is a mystery. I mean it still is when you're an adult, but the whole point of Rugrats is that babies aren't stupid, they're just very curious and new to the world. And the newest is Tommy Pickles, celebrating his first birthday in the premiere. In season 1, he lacked much of the courage and agency he later developed, and while E.G. Daly is now voicing him, her performance is more hushed and whispery than it would be in later seasons. A baby's gotta do what a baby's gotta do. A baby's gonna do what a baby's gotta do. I always like noticing vocal drifts like this, provides perspective on both how the character was created and what the voice actor gradually added to them. Phil and Lil haven't changed much since the pilot, they're still the audience to Tommy's antics, but they're now all joined by Chucky Finster, a more cautious two-year-old, less thrilled to go on their many adventures. He works as a voice of reason and the ideal contrast to Tommy, even back here, but I always like to think of him as a baby Millhouse. That helps out tremendously. But the new star of the lineup is Tommy's cousin, Angelica Pickles. She is the most hateable brat in the world, but they got a pretty interesting villain out of her. You see, being three years old, she can talk to the parents and other adults while still being fluent in Goo Goo Gargian, and that leads to all sorts of evil plots. Under an earlier plan when the Rugrats did speak fluent English but just chose not to talk to their parents, this would lead to disastrous idiot plots, so I'm glad they settled on a more realistic plan. Of course they're too young to be understood. But back to Angelica. She's a spoiled, rotten bully, smashing lamps and intentionally giving Tommy a cold, and we're in season one! It's only the beginning! Tommy's direct family includes his mother Dee Dee and father Stu. Dee Dee is a high school teacher for one episode, then becomes a nervous wreck resting on the every word of a cleverly named child psychologist, Dr. Lipschitz. Stu is my favourite character, a toy designer who claims to be an inventor, with an incredibly drab but soothing voice. Maybe Tommy's trusty screwdriver is him mimicking his father, I think that's cute. Grandpa Lou lived 15 miles away from everything, and his long-winded complaints and recollections are always a treat to listen to. Great character too. On Dee Dee's side, you have Boris and Minka, best known for their thick Yiddish accents, hailing from the old country, getting into hot water with the Anti-Defamation League after Boris appeared in a comic strip for resembling anti-Semitic caricatures from a certain country in a certain time period, even though their designs on the show had changed by that point, and the creators being confused by the controversy due to them being Jewish with the characters heavily based on their own relatives. I think Boris and Malenka are funny, but I'm not touching this lutka. Phil and Lil's parents, Betty and Howard, are an odd bunch. Betty is a lively, fit feminist, an ideal empowerment figure at a time when TV mothers needed more of that, but Howard is a black slate at this point, and in the next season, and in the one after that. It took a very long time for them to nail down who Howard was, but at least Betty came out strong. Chaz is Chucky's single father, similarly cautious and neurotic. I love Stu and all, but I'd be lying if I said Chuck wasn't the best developed character on the show. And finally, for now, there's Drew Pickles, Angelica's father and Stu's brother, so you can count on trouble always brewing. His super forgiving attitude to Angelica's bad behaviour is a big reason she's come out so bratty, 
but we'll get more explanations next season. With their parents too old and weird to listen to them, the baby's one and only hero is Reptar, a giant green lizard who destroys cities in Japanese movies. I know less about Godzilla than is possible, but I can still see Reptar as based on him, and like the juxtaposition of such young, innocent kids obsessing over a destructive monster. Finally for the season 1 lineup, there's the forgotten Larry and Steve, two teenagers who bungle their way into a myriad of minimum wage jobs. I respect that Klasky Shupo wanted to reach every possible demographic, including teenagers, but they got better at writing them long after this, long after they'd gotten some experience raising teens themselves. I'm not glad Larry and Steve disappeared after a while. I just think in an alternate universe, you'd be getting complaints that they stuck around too long and never changed enough. Why, when I was a spud, we didn't have puppet shows. We went out back and pulled up stumps. Then we'd walk 50. Miles in the snow. <laughs> Much like how The Great White Thing is a great pilot, Tommy's First Birthday is a great series premiere, giving you a firm understanding of what the average episode will be like. The babies conspire to reach a made-up goal based on misunderstanding the world around them, while the parents get caught up in some activity. We first see this formula at home, but we'll see it at a movie theatre, ball game, restaurant, school. Anywhere havoc can be caused, the parents will take their babies and in Season 1, the entertainment value varies. I guess if you're a frequenter of one of these sorts of places or remember having a job there, the episode will tickle you more. As for me, I don't care about baseball, so I struggle to care about the baseball episode. I don't think it's bad, just not my thing when the setting is this important to the story and gags. You'll notice that this season is very Tommy-centric. He's off on his own more often than he's paired with his three friends. And this is Tommy in his most basic form, just a curious infant. Episodes like Little Dude and Ruthless Tommy get their kicks from just having him crawl around, meet people, and touch things. But the knock-on effect his actions can have are never to be underestimated. I've been describing the general vibe and trends of Season 1, but there are a couple episodes later in the run that anticipate a more varied future. Episodes like Monster in the Garage that take the adventure in a more frightening, unsure direction. Real or Robots and Stewmaker's Elves, which solidify the immortal Tommy and Chucky duo, and The Trial, where the extent of Angelica's bad attitude and power over the others is raised much higher. Hopefully the budget can follow suit. Season 1's art style still has that squiggly quality of the pilot and intro, but the animation isn't quite as weird to follow through. To compensate, they love testing out weird, off-putting camera angles to make sure the surroundings more deranged and slightly less recognisable. It kind of fits for a world where children look like living peanuts. Is this your baby? Sure, Klasky Shupo were working on season 2 and 3 of The Simpsons at this time, and those were a bit glitchy but more refined than prior installments, but I feel like the scraggly weirdness of Rugrats' first season was more out of necessity than creative choice. What creative choices they did make led to some bizarre and entertaining visuals, mostly in the few dream sequences they whipped up, but I love Grandpa's teeth just for how creepy Spike looks wearing dentures. Still, in the first four episodes, it can look like Wang. Huh, who knew? It was the right time for animation to get weird like this, and it certainly paid off. Early reviews of Rugrats favorably compared it to The Simpsons, and that's about as favorable as you could get in those times so it was quickly renewed for a further 52 episodes like the other two original Nicktoons. Rugrats was the only one to make it to the 65 episode mark on Nick. I wonder why. Miss Angelica, are you sure we're locked in? Be quiet! We're running out of air! Chucky, I order you to stop breathing! Season 2 is twice as long as the first, and it's gonna feel like it. While Angelica was a rotten child before, the second season was the one they made her the villain you remember her as. In a lot of ways, this run is the start of Rugrats as you know it, but it's clearest with how they handled Angelica, making her a lot meaner, taking delight in feeding the babies false information about the world, or forcing them to be her servants somehow. On the flip side, there are a few instances where she lets her guard down and has to make a tough moral decision, and they're letting on that her infatuation with a battered and bruised Cynthia doll is making up for her missing social skills, tragic and pitiable. So there was a greater attempt to examine her behaviour instead of just letting her be a show-ruining jerk. Her development into a ruthless anti-hero is only strengthened by this season's major additions to the cast revolving around her. 
Her mother, Charlotte, a bossy businesswoman who I like to think was partially inspired by Geraldine Laybourne, Nickelodeon's president at the time. Charlotte is essentially an older, smarter, and way less psychopathic version of her daughter, and to get sidetracked, I've always loved how clearly the babies are reflections of their parents. An inventive mind, a fraidy cat, a mean boss. Everyone always speculates what they'll be like when they're older, but I think the answer is in plain sight. The Carmichaels also move into the neighborhood this season, with their youngest being Susie, a more positive and helpful toddler who ends up being Angelica's rival. She's as situational as she is useful, I hope that makes sense. But her father is a prestigious writer on the Dummy Bears, a cartoon the parents love. I feel like their reactions to the show were based on the feedback they were getting from older viewers who related to this show a bit more than their kids. I just like to think that because it's amusing. But take one look at the Dummy Bear's eyes and you'll see they closely resemble the happy little elves on The Simpsons. They serve the same purpose, to mock older, sweeter toy-based shows from the 80s and say, we're not like those other tunes. So while adding Dummy Bear talent to the cast was a neat idea that could have gone places, the animation landscape was already changing, so I get why they focused more on Reptar again eventually. Everyone else is evolving into their more recognizable forms, most notably Tommy, who's developing a friendly and adventurous personality from life experience, while Chucky's less cautious and more of a scaredy baby. He's afraid of anything they want him to be now, most notably the guy on the oatmeal box. I don't think this was a bad direction to take with him at all, it makes him more relatable and gives him obstacles to overcome. Phil and Lil are developing at a slower pace, but they've become more distinct, Phil being the grosser one and Lil being the cutesier one. The audience has been through enough with the babies to understand the relationships they have. Phil and Lil have a close bond, but are the peanut gallery to everyone else. Tommy and Chucky are our inseparable buddy duo, but have their differences on how to approach the world around them. We get more stories about them all babbling to each other about what's happened to one of them, or working as a unit to explore. It's a very believable childhood friend circle in that it's not too bogged down by separations. They play together, so they do stuff together. It's simple as that. Episodes like Together at Last or Chucky Gets Skunked are clear demonstrations of these dynamics codifying. Phil and Lil learning to miss each other, everyone reacting to Chucky getting sprayed by a skunk, it's all about the little situations that are still big and new to their minds. That's where they reach in season two. Of the established parents, the one that got the most fleshed out was easily Stu. Grandpa Lou was already fully formed and Dee Dee and Chaz are still in their reliable roles, but Stu is starting to act out with more charisma, with them giving him more inventions to work on and more absent-minded holes in their plans. With the episode count extended to 26 half hours, it's great to see that expanding on the cast was the most important initiative. They're the clearest improvement. The storytelling is still focused on exploring new places in the real world, like a toy store, an ice show, and local pool. But there are a few more surreal touches in this season, like a gorilla toy supposedly being sent back in time in Toy Palace. It's easy to brush off back there, because the point is still to depict these places as mundane to adults, but exciting dreamlands to babies. And speaking of, this is the season where we start to see what it's like when the Rugrats play pretend, going on bigger adventures than is possible in their own world. There were some dream episodes in season 1 that were more invested in being strange experiences, but when we see what they're thinking now, it's almost like we've been dropped into a different show. But perhaps the most subtle difference between season 1 and 2 is how it depicts other babies in the world. Tommy had a few conversations with unknown babies in season 1, but they usually sounded and acted like him. Here you get the big house, where Tommy's stuck in a prison break movie, with various babies closely knit to a certain area of a restrictive daycare. It's a literal breakout episode, but funnily enough, a figurative one for how they could establish new character driven situations. They take no shame in nearly all the new characters being in diapies. And it's a good thing they had the resources to make this season's adventures come to life. For one thing, The Simpsons switched their animation services from Klasky Shupo to Film Rumen this year, freeing up space at Klasky Shupo and sending more of their talent to Rugrats, and they went from outsourcing to Wang to Anavision, who cleaned up the character designs, gave the backgrounds more dimension, and refined the movement. Season 2 would have to be my favorite looking of the lot because it still looks a little rough, and I don't think Rugrats should look too clean and cutesy. There are still a lot of those strange camera angles and directing choices that keep the experience surprising. They aren't too familiar with the world, so you shouldn't be either. 
If there's one area I think season two is more annoying than the first, it's the mispronunciations or rugrat speak. For example, they don't know what a dog groomer is, so they call it a dog broomer. They kept it to a minimum in season one, but found more humor in it here, it seems. I don't hate it, I think it can be cute sometimes, but it's going to get more forced as the series goes on. Stu, what are you doing? Making chocolate pudding. It's four o'clock in the morning. Why on earth are you making chocolate pudding? Because I've lost control of my life. This right here is the zenith of Rugrats. You know it, I know it, and it comes from what I consider the greatest season, the third. Imagine that, I consider a show to have peaked in season three. I've got to make a video about why shows usually peak here, but Rugrats will remain a useful example for why it's so often the case. It's tempting to say, well, it's just season two, but better. And while it's true that season three takes what worked about two and pushes further, the adjustments it made to the whole series up to this point are awesome to see. The writers had gotten enough experience with these characters and their world that they could work around the bottom of the idea pool they were reaching. Among the more imaginative plot lines, there are a few generic plot lines you would have seen in plenty of sitcoms, but there's always a Rugrats twist to them, as where's it is to say. Chucky is rich about the Finsters becoming millionaires could have been disastrously forgettable. You can picture an episode all about Chucky being spoiled and snobbish, but no, the focus is on Angelica trying to take his toys and Chaz being bad with money. You're left impressed that it's not the worst take on the story out there. I'm also charmed by the ending of Farewell My Friend, where Tommy and Chucky do the old polite arguing routine, but it extends into the credits and you hear an outtake on the copyright notice. Nifty stuff. Overall, this is a far funnier season too. There are still jokes in service to the silly scenarios, but I feel like everyone's sense of humor this go around was fine-tuned. Chucky's a little more sarcastic, Phil can be more blunt, Angelica's punished for her actions harsher and more frequently. To say nothing of the parents, who haven't seemed to gain much experience from raising kids. They can still be fun to follow, but it often feels like the babies have more brains than them. Not a bad thing for a show with loose themes of kid empowerment, but there's only so much further you can go. One area no other season of Rugrats went further with was in dark content. Season one was weird, season two was harsh, and season three, for a show about babies, went to some strangely tense places. If you ever see an article that states that Rugrats is darker than you remember, most of their examples are guaranteed to come from this season. Chucky has a nightmare about Spike talking, Angelica has a nightmare about getting a baby brother, Drew has a nightmare about losing to Angelica in court, Chucky has a nightmare that the whole town is fallen to pieces in a world where he wasn't born, Chaz has a nightmare about the characters having too many nightmares. We're shoved into the characters' heads every chance they get. It's the best way for them to show us something outlandish, but keep the focus on what our cast is feeling and how they're reacting to a situation. I don't feel like this occasional shift into darker, more serious storytelling is a perversion of the show. In fact, it's telling that they were treating the viewers with respect, expecting them to follow along and get an important lesson and learn something new about these people. I Remember Melville is an episode a lot of people point to as a shining example of how tactfully they could handle a topic like the death of a pet. It's low stakes in the situation, with the pet just being a bug, but dang if these babies aren't braver by the end of the story. On the subject of pet endangerment, there's one scene in Spike Runs Away that got to me. If you guessed correctly what the episode is about, after Spike's been gone for two weeks, his owners begin speculating where he wound up. Tommy and Chucky theorize he's on Jupiter, and Tommy dreams that Spike's on a far-off dog paradise. Stu and Dee Dee, more realistically, imagine that Spike's become a homeless stray, cold, hungry, and scared. I was lucky enough to watch this one a couple days before we had to put down our dog of 12 years, so it got the reaction it wanted out of me. If you want to have a nightmare about endangered pets to be a season 3 Rugrats episode yourself, make sure that nightmare's a flashback because this season loves those too. They get one to when Stu and Drew were babies themselves, a series that chronicles Angelica's addiction to cookies, and as a finale, the story of how Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil first met, and as a finale, the story of how Moses let the Israelites out of Egypt. They really had their minds on the past before long. Both the season three finale in production order and in broadcast order show us why some of our characters are here today, the former on a contemporary level, the latter on a historical level. I've heard this Passover special has been shown in religious studies classes, and while I was shown the Prince of Egypt, Rugrats did a nifty retelling. 
One overarching quirk to season 3 you'll have to get used to is how it's presented. Most episodes have this distracting purple tint to them. I've been doing a lot of colour correction for these screen caps, so here's what you're missing. Purple's already pretty common in the show's colour scheme, up to and including the sky, so it can feel like it's diminishing the pop of the other colours in a world designed to be as vibrant as can be. I'm getting into semantics again, so that's a good time to move on before I start talking telescene gibberish. Onward to season 4, and here's where things get odd. Look everybody! It's the lady I told you about, from my dreams! While the early seasons did well ratings-wise in the Nicktoons original Sunday morning time slot, in the fall of 1994, Nickelodeon moved Rugrats to Saturday evenings, where it quickly transformed into a consistently popular show. Nickelodeon's ethos was clearer in 1994 than ever before and would ever be again. Get messy, have fun, be a kid. Who can do that better than the Rugrats? The ball kept on rolling, and shortly after Geraldine Laybourne left Nickelodeon, her successor, Herb Scannell, got Klasky Schuper to resume production of new Rugrats episodes in the summer of 1996. But a big problem presented itself quickly. The writing team was fractured since production ended three years earlier. Arlene Klasky and Paul Germain never saw eye to eye on how mature the show should be, and he and Joe Ensenablare were now deep in pre-production on a new Prison break cartoon for Disney, Recess. Some of the other older writers like Steve Vixton and Craig Bartlett were now working on another Nicktoon, Hey Arnold, the latter creating it. Only one writer on the first three seasons would ever return, Barbara Slade. Everyone else was new. Even writing talent on the Nicktoon Klasky Super produced in the interim, Our Real Monsters, was slim. But all the voice actors returned, as did many of the animators and directors, and lead composer Mark Mothersbaugh to weave his unusual music, so some areas of production were more fine than others. A new writing team had to be assembled though, and they were eased into the process with a series of specials released from December 1996 to July 1997. A Hanukkah special, basically leaving right where the original left off in terms of cultural representation. A Mother's Day special, which explored why Chaz's wife isn't around. And the direct-to-video special Vacation, where the families go to Las Vegas, babies and all. While they all proved successful with audiences in various ways, Vacation is the one with the real, here's where things start to go wrong vibes. It's just the gang running around this big, dangerous place and creating an unrealistically wacky mess that doesn't get cleaned up or resolved. I feel like this one had an ulterior purpose of testing the waters for if a large-scale Rugrats adventure would be worth watching, because Rugrats had gotten so popular that it was now slated for the big screen. That's still a year and a half away, so for now, back to the old grind. Phew, I made it! Here! Between the specials and movie, 26 new half hours yet on Nickelodeon, but every Rugrats episode guide I've ever seen claims this to be two seasons, the first 15 being season 4, and the later 11 being season 5. I personally don't know what this is all about, because all but the finale have a copyright date of 1997. So it's not like there are too many major differences between these runs. There are a few, but not enough to understand why this is the cutoff point. This early revival era is also peculiar in that many episodes were released early on VHS, not making Vacation an isolated incident. I guess hosting never-before-seen episodes is a good selling point, but I wonder if there were any annoying scheduling issues with the show. It wouldn't be the last time a Nicktoon would be guilty of this. Visually, Classy Shuper were willing to give the show some tune-ups, some of which are fine, others I don't think were the right call. The easiest way to tell if you're watching a season 4, 5, or 6 episode is if the sky has a gradient. It's nothing major, the gradient and a few more shadows here and there give the world more depth. I don't understand some of these changes, like the title card takes going from red to black, maybe so it looks less like blood, but I can't be too sure. As for character design changes, Boris was given bigger eyes, Angelica's iconic blonde hair was often darkened to a strawberry blonde shade, and most deviously, they gave Phil earlobes. Let me tell you why. There's a running gag that Betty can't tell Phil and Lil apart except for the clothes, but if you're attentive, you could see Lil has earlobes and Phil doesn't. This change makes them look identical, spoiling the joke. They cut Phil's earlobes off again during season 6, but they still pop up in the movies. 
but by far my least favourite addition to Season 4 was Timmy McNulty. To make up for Susie becoming the angel opposite of Angelica, someone who's guaranteed to win in the end, a new foil was created with a four-year-old boy who could be just as bratty as Angelica. The problem is that throughout the early seasons, you gradually understood why Angelica's turned out the way she has, and get more moments of her being punished and feeling guilty for her actions. You never get that with Timmy. He's how Angelica's critics view her, a snot-nosed pain who makes the show less pleasant every time he's on screen. And I can see why such criticism became more major in this era, since Angelica is given less character development than in season 2 or 3, but she's still nowhere near as bad as Timmy. Other than him, season 4 is more Rugrats. It's not as good as the first three, but still mostly full of good episodes. It's kind of amazing it didn't completely fall apart here with a completely different set of writers, but you can sense the directors, animators, and voice actors doing a lot of the heavy lifting, giving it their all now that they're back in the job. They've started to make some of the parents like Stu and Charlotte more temperamental, less mature, and willing to take responsibility for their screw-ups or even be aware of them. It can be frustrating if you like following the parents' side of the story, but part of the point of Rugrats is that as much as the parents don't understand the babies, the babies don't understand the parents either. So I guess they were leaning more into the bumbling parents department here, which is better in small doses than as their default behaviour. Guess what, it'll soon be their default behaviour. To get the most tragic change in Season 5 out of the way, this run had the last episodes to feature David Doyle playing Grandpa Lou, as he passed away in 1997. In his place came Joe Alasky, who sounds jarring and doesn't say 15 as forcefully, but serves the character well. These 11 episodes really like to look to the past for inspiration, bringing back familiar characters and concepts from the original run to see what can be added to them. Fluffy, Aunt Miriam, and Dee Dee's brother Ben and his wife Elaine all get sequel episodes, and Jonathan, the mystery man on the phone Charlotte's always talking down to, is revealed to be a lower level businessman envious of his boss's success. Unfortunately, one consequence of treading old ground is treading old ground. The stories are starting to feel really been there done that. We get another episode where the babies explore an old folks facility. Another one where Tommy and Chucky fear that one of their fathers is some sort of monster during a sleepover. Another one where Chucky falls in love with a girl. If you gave me the choice between these retreads and the older episodes, I'd watch the older episodes. You can still see these are their own things, there are enough changes I guess, and when they do a really clever and innovative premise, it shines all the more in a season in love with the past. So far, it's surprising to me how consistently well they've written Tommy, Chucky, Phil and Lil. They've remained basic but likeable enough characters to be thrown into any story, and they're still the explorer, the Freddy cat, and the tiny twosome you expect. But right at the season finale, the family tree, they run into a very hard wall. The episode is about Angelica telling Chucky to return to the Finster tree and unbirth himself, it makes sense in context, after he fears his family's taken a shine to Tommy. There are lines that imply they know that a majority of the information Angelica feeds them is lies to get them in trouble. Angelica made all that stuff up just to make you mad at me. Why would she do that? Cause she's Angelica. Oh, you're right. Great you acknowledge this after five seasons, but terrible you acknowledge this when you still have four seasons to go. Now whenever they get conned, gaslit, smippledorfed, whatever you want to call it, it's going to feel more horrible knowing they know they're being hurt by her. And remember, continuity was given more emphasis starting with this season, so it's not like they forget all the stories after they happen, even if babies wouldn't remember a full week. I might be overthinking this dynamic, but The Family Tree is a pivotal episode, leading into the first Rugrats movie. We thought the fun times would last forever. <laughs> but we was wrong. Dee Dee's pregnant again, and this time, the whole gang gets to be close to the miraculous birth of a new pickle. But it's not miraculous for the pickle family for long. Dill turns out to be a problem child, being a much louder and needier newborn than Tommy ever was. Weeks are mercifully skipped over, and the story actually begins with the babies driving Stu's new invention, the Riptar Wagon, into the wilderness. Releasing on November 20th, 1998, at the very peak of Rugrats popularity, it broke records notably being the first non-Disney animated movie to gross over a hundred million domestically, 
and while not being the first movie to be based on an animated series, inspired an oversaturation of them for the next six years. But all the success wouldn't mean much if the movie was bad. So the success doesn't mean much. The biggest problem it brings to the Rugrats as a whole is Dill's role. I can just about put up with the bawling and poop jokes, that's just surface level annoyance. On a deeper level, Dill goes completely against the point of Rugrats, to treat babies like they have independence and their own language and perspective on the world. How you don't know how smart a baby could be if you turn your back on it. Dill is literally just a mindless, uninteresting baby who can't even speak to the others. His one and only use in the movie is to teach Tommy about responsibility, which Stu lays on thick. It's a pretty sweet scene until you wake up and realize that Stu's entrusted his one-year-old infant with a valuable locket. You lovable dunce, you almost got an emotion out of me. I appreciate them taking the action to a new place we never would have expected, the wilderness. A real baby would die in here within 10 minutes, but Tom, Chuck, Phil, and Lil are pretty much immortal. You'd think these rangers played by David Spade and Whoopi Goldberg would detect them sooner, given how much ground they cover. The escaped circus monkeys didn't make me laugh, they feel like the scraps of an abandoned Wild Thornberries episode, but they add to the most intense scene of the movie, where at his lowest point, Tommy attempts sacrificing Dill to them. This is a pretty good scene, the staging and colours are wonderfully dramatic, and E.G. Daly's letting her heart out into making Tommy feel real. One of her all-time best performances, hidden in this mire. And because all the biggest animated movies at the time were musicals, the Rugrats movie had to be one too, ranging from covers to original songs, and I didn't find any of them memorable and certainly not timeless counting the credits. They never advanced the plosh and are more there to show off some strange visuals, which the show had been dabbling in less since coming back. The world is something new to me is the standout for all the wrong reasons, namely showing that even newborns are capable of speaking and thinking, but not Dill. Outside the songs, the animation quality varies. Some scenes really are that meme of how show movies are just the show with better shading, and I believe these were the first ones to be animated, and they slowly got better until they were able to harness a more theatrical take on the Rugrats animation style. One that doesn't lose much of the charm, but still looks very different. But still, it's clear the animation quality here is inconsistent, as is the writing and themes. It's not like Rugrats can't work on the big screen, anything can with the right idea and talent, but this had neither. And now that Dill's part of the regular cast on the show, its quality is only going to slide downhill faster. But before I move on, I'll bring up another positive, how since this was the first movie based on a Nicktoon, they were smart to bring them in swinging. Slap T Pooch from Oh Yeah Cartoons appears in the Nickelodeon Movies logo, and they played a special cat dog short before the movie in theaters, Fetch. I'll save my thoughts on Cat Dog for later, but this is an extremely annoying but extremely creative adventure. Oh, I guess I didn't save my thoughts on the show for later. I think my daddy built a Dillo rocket chimp! Wow! Season 6, the first of the post Dill era as fans like to call it, is 33 half hours of mediocrity. Not total mediocrity, it's got good and bad episodes, but it all adds up to a pretty unhappy 5 out of 10. Interestingly, a lot of these episodes have a copyright date of 1998, but I suppose it was imperative that these air after the movie, in the United States at least. That's the most likely reason season 4 and 5 had to be stretched so thin, but they pushed out season 6 as quickly as they could at first, and it still took them two and a half years to finish airing it. In airtime as well as content, the season meanders. Remember how they acknowledged how many times Angelica had duped them last season? Well, she doesn't just do it even more in this one, but they've ground the formula into increasingly forced and forgettable situations. In general, most of the episodes this season blend together and fail to stand out. Try to count how many begin in the backyard before you die. It's at this point they delve into the imagination adventures more often, which sure, just take a stock setting and plump the babies in, with them mispronouncing words for added cutesy wootsiness but they've always got new visuals and break up the tedium the homeworld has been taken over by. The season's a clear case of quantity over quality. A show like this doesn't need 33 episode seasons. At least, that's how most Rugrats historians document it. And I hate to say, they pushed Dill a lot in this season, to prove he was a new mainstay. One who couldn't do anything except be a baby for the babies to look after. He's so useless 
that they have to give him an electric stroller to move around since he can't walk yet. And such a prop that most of his starring episodes like Raising Dill and Planting Dill are about the others doing things to him. The times they get me to care about him are super rare because this sort of baby depiction was never the point of Rugrats. At least when Poof was added to the Fairly Odd Parents a decade later, they could tell a couple stories with him at first that gave Timmy new challenges to overcome. It's sort of funny they found a way into the add a baby pitfall in a show about babies. They used to exceed your expectations for a show about babies, but now it's getting very cliched and very samey. The new things season 6 offers are very minimal. The season saw some developments for Betty's world, as we meet her brother who might be a men's rights activist, and learn about how she proposed to Howard. Whoa! Upside down gorilla press! I used that move to get Howard to pop the question! <laughs> Wait a minute. We didn't need to know this. But speaking of Howard, this is oddly the season that defined who he was. Lucky him. They put him in more active roles with the other fathers, and gave in to the idea that he was a cowardly wuss not having much in the way of physical strength or emotional control. I hope the payoff was worth it. In contrast to the way Season 5 added onto the series past, Six was more keen on just referencing it for jokes. I like the part at the end of Zoo Story where Stu lists a bunch of places he's taken the kids to, and when Chucky sings about picking up his troubles in music, he packs up objects that scared him in earlier episodes. I don't need to hear characters like this sing, but that's beside the point. The point is, the continuity is still a noticeable part of the season, which does nothing to help the more basic and repetitive writing when they're just encouraging me to watch the old episodes. What makes season 6 stand out from the first 5 is how long it is, but that means more room for specials, and we've got 4 new ones. I'll only go into the first two, but there's also Be My Valentine and Discover America, where they don't kill any natives so it's false advertising. The first special, Runaway Riptar, is notable for not just being the first hour-long Rugrats episode, but the first hour-long Nicktoon ever. Plus it marks the point Rugrats switched to Digital Ink and Paint, and while they went back to cells for the rest of the sixth season, going back to Digital permanently for the seventh, I think it gives the show a vastly inferior look in a lot of ways. But enough of that, the story is that the babies watch a Reptar movie where he's seemingly become a bad guy, and so obsessed with his morality today, travel into the movie and figure out what's going on. This is their biggest homage to Godzilla, parodying the absurd foes and silly dubbing, but since I haven't seen any movies about the big G, the smaller references are lost on me. But the good thing is, I've seen The Wizard of Oz. Why is that a good thing? Well, because it's the focus of their next homage, No Place Like Home, where while Susie's getting her tonsils out, she dreams she's going on a journey through the land of lots of tots. I can't necessarily call it better, but I got more enjoyment out of it simply by understanding the references. You come to me on the day of this wedding and ask me to take care of the boys who made your brother cry? I didn't know that would be a good segue into Rugrats in Paris, but first I've got to give some context behind this point in the timeline, inside and outside of the show. As Nickelodeon left the 90s behind and survived the leap into the 2000s, Rugrats was still their biggest show, but people were starting to get sick of it. The revival episodes weren't far off from outnumbering the original set, making it seem less like a resurrection and more like a spirit wandering the airwave limbo. SpongeBob SquarePants was quickly catching up to it in the ratings, and ready to take its place as Nickelodeon's most popular show, but Nick still felt like squeezing a couple more seasons, movies, and eventually spin-offs out of Rugrats, despite the receding popularity. I don't like it when articles and essays point to overdoing Spongebob as the one and only reason Nickelodeon lost its way, because they were on that track before with Rugrats. Sure, with Spongebob it's gotten way more out of control, but it was set in stone with them squeezing too much material out of Rugrats, not knowing when enough was enough. They couldn't do many more stories with babies, and adding Dill had led to diminishing results, so they had to further change things. The season 7 premiere is an autumn trilogy all about change, acorn nuts and diapy butts. Their individual titles are just as bad. Everywhere in the babies' lives, change is in the air. Phil and Lil get changed into super big, rubbery diapers, Lou moves out and starts dating a nurse called Lulu, and Chaz is egged on to start dating again. The dating montage is fun, it has a good song, but it doesn't feel like Rugrats. It doesn't have the simple, friendly charm that initially pulled you in. When these episodes do feel like Rugrats, they feel like a version of the show that's regretting being dragged out for so long. And it's not really assisted by the full switch over to digital colouring. 
The first six seasons had their ups and downs in terms of animation quality, but they still looked uniquely raw and unconventional. Seeing them without the shadows and subtle lighting flourishes that come with cell animation removes a lot of that character, and makes the world feel less welcoming. I get why they had to switch, budget cuts, evolving animation landscape, all of that, but this trilogy had a massive visual downgrade. They slowly get more detailed and vibrant in due time, as they figure out how to embrace the new technology, and certain relationships in-universe are looking up. Shaz has a hole in his heart to fill, and Lou and Lulu are getting engaged, leading into the second theatrical Rugrats movie. But father, we found a dish in our crib. Well, that's what you get for wiping your boogers on Cynthia! Oh, great, now it doesn't make any sense. Well, as you can see from this title, this November 17th, 2000 release is about the cast of Rugrats traveling to Paris, after Stu becomes the designer for a new Reptar animatronic at Euro Reptar Land. If you were expecting some jokes about the rocky start of Euro Disneyland, sorry to say, you get sumo karaoke instead. In fact, you get a lot of weird, exciting scenes in this movie. Airport shenanigans, an exotic hotel room, a wild time at Euro Reptar Land, and a giant battle across the City of Love. Is it good? It's better than the first movie, at least. The writers did a better job at tying these wild new concepts to a story that feels like it matters. It's about Chaz finally being ready to move on from Melinda, and falling in love with the sinister Coco Labouche, played by Sally Sarandon, who simply wants to marry him for her image. Quite the coincidence her lackey's played by John Lithgow. But she gets all her dating advice from her assistant Kira, who's much more in line with what Chaz wants, so you're playing the waiting game until they call it off and Chaz and Kira finally marry instead. This movie is also notable for introducing another new Rugrat, Kira's daughter Kimmy. I guess she has a Hello Kitty shirt, that's how you know they're from Japan. In her introductory movie, she's not very important to the story, but she is there to be nice to the other babies, adding to the notion that Chaz and Kira being together would be ideal. Sorry Coco, but there's only room for one villain in this series. Aiding you is the fact they've softened Angelica over time, to the point it isn't out of the blue that she reveals her part in Coco's plan to the babies and admits she messed up. That's a nice thing to see in a movie. And so is Chucky and Chaz's relationship developing. I can give this more thought than Stu and Tommy's relationship because Chucky's a bit older and they're closer of a family. Until now, that is. It all leads to Chucky's first word, a monumental moment in the show's canon, giving you the impression that he's grown up from the experience in the slightest way. Overall, I think Rugrats in Paris is a big improvement over the first movie, and not just because it has less Dill to go around. The animation's more consistently tops, with the Klesky Shupo feature team hitting their stride here, and the scope is larger in a more interesting and sensical way than last time. At least until we get to the big robot chase scene, but at least the plot used what it had and didn't look back. The jokes are a little smarter across the board, there are plenty of memorable set pieces, and the soundtrack is more of a bop. Still very dated to the turning point between 90s and 2000s pop, but I wouldn't argue with who let the dogs out. I will argue with season seven, though. Oh. How come you never licked my face, Lillian? For this season only, they completely changed up the format of the show. Instead of consisting of two 11-minute segments, you now get two 8-10 to 10 minute segments with a short in between. In theory, I can see this format working. The plots are less substantial in this era, so making the runtimes shorter overall would be a godsend. Really, it's hard to notice they're any shorter than previously while you're watching them, due to how little they can do with their story beats now. Many of these stories demand less padding to be workable, so this was just barely a positive. Sadly, I don't think the shorts were a good idea. A lot of them use their short time in creative ways, but many of them are just a joke or two that they couldn't squeeze into another episode. These are what feel like padding, just making sure they could hit 20 minutes whatever way they can. Who cares if some of them are glorified bumpers? That's the world you're living in with season 7, one of good ideas with big caveats. I don't like how busy the new intro is, but it's good that they changed it at all, because while the original worked for the first season or two, it was looking pretty out of place now. Kimmy was the third and final major addition to the Rugrat crew, and while it's nice that Chucky has a new little sister, her usefulness is at the whims of the situations they think up for her. When they pair just her and Chucky, she works as a wide-eyed explorer who helps Chucky come out of his shell, while Chucky has to keep her safe. But when Tommy's around... Uh... 
why don't they just use Tommy? That's the problem when you realise Kimmy shares too much in common with Tommy. They made their main character feel interchangeable. I can see an episode like Bigger Than Life playing out the exact same way if Tommy was the focus instead of Kimmy, which is probably why they scoured for excuses to leave Kimmy and Chucky alone. It's pretty surprising to me that, as of Season 7, the writers haven't messed up Tommy and Chucky too badly. Their dynamic has been corrupted, but on their own, they feel like the exact same characters as before the revival. It's impressive how they're holding out. I say this because the others have noticeably suffered over time. Phil and Lil's routine has worn thin, Angelica no longer has any sort of commanding presence, just becoming a generic brat on par with Timmy McNulty, and most of the parents are stuck in limbo. Except for Chaz, of course. It really seems like the writers have been coddling him recently. Like, they felt so bad for him losing Melinda that they've recently done everything in their power to make his life better. He has a loving wife again, and a healthy daughter, and a new dog, and Fifi. Oh hell, let's just have Spike and Fifi elope and give Jazz a puppy for good measure, and have him start up a coffee house with Kira. He goes through the most change of any character in the show. And while in-universe it's all good, you could argue it makes him less interesting and gives him and Chucky less of a special connection. By the time Season 7 finished airing, Rugrats had been on TV for 10 years, so the crew put together an anniversary special that asked what the show would be like if the Rugrats aged naturally and were now tweens. They have admitted over the years that they were heavily inspired by blogs and fan art on the internet that asked the same question, so they had an audience no matter what. A big one. All Growed Up ended up being the highest viewed broadcast on Nickelodeon ever, with 11.9 million viewers tuning in which would have been good numbers for network television, let alone cable. This is prime real estate in television history that Spongebob's never been able to eat into. It hasn't come close, actually. That and getting a star on the Walk of Fame, which totally wasn't paid for and Spongebob totally doesn't deserve more, but I'm getting on a tangent. What's all growed up like? It's an extremely generic tween slice of life story where Angelica wants to impress a new friend, but brags too hard and whips up a scheme to blackmail Tommy and Chucky into helping her out. It was cool they made all these new designs for older kid versions of the Rugrats and middle-aged versions of the parents, but neither these or the story warranted a spin-off series in my opinion. It's not unsalvageably bad, but it's a story you've seen a thousand times before, just with Rugrats characters now, and a couple plot holes they didn't have time to fill up in this new world. There's a running gag of Phil being nostalgic for the good old days when they were really little kids playing in sandboxes and stuff. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, and going to Tommy's backyard seems like an everyday occurrence. It almost feels like Phil's the only one who knows they've just gone through a time skip. The biggest problem with the story is that it hinges on the idea that Tommy's an innocent goody two-shoes who never got into trouble with Dee Dee and Stu at any point in his first 11 years of existence, to the point that him getting grounded is treated like some earth-shatteringly big deal. But if his dynamic with Angelica hasn't changed, with her using him to do questionable things for her, surely this can't be the first time he's ever gotten in trouble. This whole framing device of the babies discussing this in the present feels like it's setting up the wrong problem. I don't mind them setting this up like it's the babies escaping to the future, but there had to be a more sensical and compelling angle to set up. As is, All Growed Up is fine, but it doesn't give me much hope for the spin-off. Take your teeth or guess what? I dress myself today! You look very nice, Harold. Thanks! Bozo himself couldn't have done a better job. We're starting Season 8 with another backdoor pilot to another spin-off, Preschool Days. It's terrible. Like, actually terrible as both an episode and a pilot. Want to put Angelica and Susie in preschool? Fine. You already did that with Angelica, but fine. But why have you given us new characters with such basic and unremarkable characteristics? Only two stick out. Miss Weimer, who's an emotional wreck, how hilarious, and Harold, who's over-the-top obnoxious. Angelica and Susie's rivalry hasn't changed much to suit the new setting or challenges awaiting them. Susie's a little more competitive, but by now, it sort of feels off base for her to stoop to Angelica's level. Everything about this episode feels cobbled together and uneventful, so I took no pleasure in seeing them return to the preschool several times throughout the rest of the show. And when the spin-off finally materialized, it had an overall shorter run than the Rugrats episodes hyping it up, and I couldn't be more relieved. 
Poorly conceived spin-offs weren't the only sign that Rugrats hype was over. Christine Cavanaugh retired from voice acting in 2001, so Nancy Cartwright stepped in as her replacement for Chucky, starting with the episode Quiet Please, a role she does to this day. I don't mind her take on the character, but it's clear as day that the show didn't have much more strength to keep going and naturally heal itself. The final major addition to the cast in season 8 was Taffy, and she was the final nail in the coffin for me. I held up hope and got Taffy instead, this enthusiastic teenage songwriter who becomes the Rugrats' new babysitter. I think Amanda Bynes is a talented actress, but her direction made her sound so annoying, like this unnatural mix of patronizing and airheaded. She does seem to be dense for a teen, and I don't know if that was by design. You'd think with how many shows Classy Shupa were now doing about tweens and teens that some of their Rugrats writers would know how to write them, but they must have been really restrained by the show's success. The reason I'm grouping season 8 and 9 together isn't just because they ran through the same years, but because I really have nothing to say about season 9. Nothing nice at least. The last big introductions like the preschool, Java Lava, Spike and Fifi's kids, and Taffy all happened throughout season 8 leaving 9 to feel extremely empty and aimless. When I was keeping private tabs on ranking the whole show, 9 sparked so little enthusiasm from me that none of its episodes ranked higher than the worst season 3 episode. Its best episode is just okay, otherwise I was getting nothing out of continuing to watch the show this season. October 5th 2002 saw the premiere of the season 9 finale, Kimmy Takes the Cake, but Rugrats wouldn't finish airing on Nickelodeon until August 1st, 2004. Neither of these airings sparked any fanfare. Most people were just sick of Rugrats or watching All Grown Up instead, but Nick still couldn't get the hint. It, look, it, it, it's kind of a damp smell that's a cross between sour milk and poop. Ew! Well, actually, I kind of like it. Remember back in my Wild Thornberries review when I called this movie the end of cinema as we know it? My opinion hasn't changed much. This is still a very messy, unfocused, and uninteresting script. When I first watched it, I'd finished up with The Wild Thornberries and had that show as my primary frame of reference, so the jungle setting wasn't jarring to me. Now seeing this after getting through 9 seasons of Rugrats, it couldn't be more jarring! I mean, the first Rugrats movie already covered a general wilderness setting, so the bulk of the action isn't anything new, but the ways they try to have the Rugrats characters bounce off this new location were pretty strange. Stu almost getting the others killed at sea is something I can never forgive him for, so this being the last produced piece of media we see this iteration of the character at this age feels like such a poor note to end on. Lil becomes a vegetarian, leaving Phil to feel alone in his love of eating bugs. This plot thread is never elaborated on or concluded after its first scene, and I don't know yet if they stuck with this change for Lil in All Grown Up, so it comes off as a quick way to give them some importance. And worst of all is Spike, played by Bruce Willis. I already went over how much of a missed opportunity this was for the character, but I finally have some context for the line about him having a family back home. I guess it was all worth it to see the Rugrats and Nigel Thornberry almost suffocate in a bathysphere again. I know I should be scared or sad, but it's too strange of a concept for me not to laugh at. Now I have context for how bad Rugrats got over time. It was a slow burn, but this scene cooled me off. And then Tales from the Crib set my house on fire and called it a light show. First teased in 2003, these two director video specials were released in 2005 and 2006 respectively, the latter being the final piece of Rugrats media to finish production after 15 years, and being the final for another 15 years. They're just retellings of fairy tales with the Rugrats characters plastered on. That's it. The first one is Snow White, the second one is Jack and the Beanstalk. The animation isn't anything to praise, the songs are boring, and the stories have virtually nothing going for them except the presence of Rugrats characters. This is especially true in the case of Three Jacks and a Beanstalk, which has fewer Rugrats characters to use. I can't stress enough that these specials would be completely forgotten today if they didn't feature the Rugrats. They're dreadfully nothing. And that's where I'm going to stop for this review. I'll cover the spin-off sometime way into the future once my Rugrats fatigue wears off, but coming to the end of the review, you all know it's time for me to rate my favourite episodes. For the best list, I've got a rather generous top 20 prepared to make up for the fact this is such a long running show. That being said, all my picks come from the first 5 seasons. Pretend to act surprised. 
Weaning Tommy is an early triumph in the balancing act between the adult and infant perspectives of early development. You get some mundane conversations about weaning Tommy off his bottle, then Tommy having a nightmare conveying how upsetting this change is to him. Slumber Party has a similar structure, but I thought this one was tighter overall. The first cut probably would have frightened me when I was a kid, and not just for this angle. Tommy gets a cut on a finger, and they show blood. Besides that, it's fun to see how babies understand injuries, and Angelica's way of taunting them is oddly morbid if you think too hard about it. The slide is one of those straight to the point episodes Rugrats often does very well. Chucky becomes afraid of slides after a bad experience at a play area. This setup sticks out to me as feeling rather surreal, helping to feed into the fear and making it more challenging but rewarding to believe in a happy ending. Reptar on Ice is definitely the kid's funniest run in with the dinosaur in real life. You can tell the writers wanted to do an ice show episode, but felt the need to add something odd to the show to make it more memorable. It worked. An ice skating musical about Reptar is too ridiculous to pass up. The word of the day is one of those famous swearing episodes, which takes a lot of joy from making Angelica learn a naughty word and crafting a great story around it. It could have been easy to write off as just cutesy child swearing shock value, but it's all in the timing for this one. I remember Melville took a pretty big risk by assuming the audience could be on board with the Rugrats grieving, but the stakes are so low that you can buy it. Seeing Chucky get so distraught by the death of a pill bug may be... Uh, let me just find a different word to use. Seeing Chucky get so distraught by the death of a pill bug may be sad, but the mood isn't completely somber. You still get great comedic moments like this. So, anything exciting that the wall has got? Mm, nothing much. So I found a piece of gum under a rock. Yeah, and Lily ate another mud pie. Neat. And oh yeah, your bug died. What? In the Dreamtime isn't a one-hit wonder in my opinion. It's a two-hit wonder. I'm kidding. It's great all around. I'm sure we all wondered if life was a dream at this age, so throwing Chucky two creative nightmares, then confusing the heck out of him, made for a strangely relatable story. Angelica the Magnificent sees her witchcraft know no bounds. Warped by the sense of power a magic kid has given her, she seems to make Lil disappear. Angelica realizing she screwed up is cathartic to witness, but Lil believing she's a butterfly is extremely cute. This might be her best spotlight. When Wishes Come True is the one where they think Tommy turned Angelica into a statue. The real reason for this perception is just as odd. Drew getting an ice sculpture of her that's daughter. That's just insanity. But it made for a great episode, and one of Tommy's toughest. The stalk is the inevitable one where the babies learn where they came from. Only Susie's mature enough to know for sure, but this has some cute shenanigans with them thinking it comes from an egg for most of the runtime. This is automatically the best Dill episode. The Santa experience gave us what we all wanted for a Christmas special, Angelica desperately trying to straighten up and fly right. Petrified by the fear of getting nothing but coal, her methods of securing a happy Christmas are dubious, but a step towards a more nuanced character who isn't a complete little tyrant. On the topic of holiday viewings, Chucky's Wonderful Life is a very picky and skewed take on the classic movie, with Chucky believing that without him, the entire town he lives in would fall into chaos. Psst, don't tell him no one kid is this important. It's a good learning experience for him anyway. Toy Palace is basically every kid's dream come true up to middle school. Tommy and Chucky stay in the biggest toy store known to humankind after closing, and go on their usual adventures while Stu and Chaz lose their Father of the Year awards. One of many times where Reptar might have saved their lives. What the big people do is our very first tease at what the Rugrats would look like at a more advanced age. It's a bit of a joke look, with their distorted view of adulthood coming off as wacky and weird. I don't remember picturing myself as a grown up until I was like 7 or 8, but the second half of this thing it makes me relieved I didn't. The box may have a familiar setup to Spongebob fans, but it predates their box adventures by about 9 years and actually shows us what goes on in their imaginations. This is one of many high tier episodes that gets around to most or all of the core Rugrats cast, and it's always neat when they all have a part to play in the premise. The mysterious Mr. Fiend is easily the show's clearest and most effective dip into horror. The babies keep having to fight off Mr. Friend, a clown toy made by Stu that comes off significantly creepier than he intended. Even when it turns into an epic robo throwdown, you're going to be on board with it because you want to see the kids come out victorious. Reptar 2010 is quite an inspirational episode. The babies are watching the new Reptar movie on TV when the tape gets ruined, so they each make up their own ending. We all know how 2010 went now, 
but it's cool to see all the Rugrats as Reptar, not understanding the pitfalls of projecting yourself onto a character. I'd like to hear if anyone who watched this episode as a kid for the first time got cut off and decided to fill the blanks like the characters did with their viewing. Home Videos was a remarkable little showcase, suggested by one of their directors, the babies creating their own little animated movies. Tommy's too young for his drawings to be coherent, Chucky's are a therapy session, and Angelica's always gotta be the centre of attention. Their characters are wondrously portrayed even in such primitive art. Mother's Day has got to be the most iconic special of its variety, exploring some of the limitless meanings for being a mother. If they just explored what the living mothers have been through, that would be sweet enough, but finally showing us what Chucky's mother was like was worth the heartbreak. This definitely helped out younger viewers who never knew theirs. But my favourite episode would be Angelica Breaks a Leg. Not just for the chocolate pudding scene. It's the quintessential demo for how rotten Angelica can be with the wrong influence, wrongest set of coincidences, and wrongest upbringing. I love just about every scene in this thing. It's like a classic Simpsons episode that wound up in the wrong office. It's that good. Now time to name my least favourites, and I couldn't have picked any other number to list. Cooking with Phil and Lil is one of those season 7 shorts where they accidentally ruin a pie Dee Dee made. That's the only point to it. It feels almost worthless. Music isn't a total waste of time, but it's an annoying way to understand why these characters should sing as little as possible. I like E.G. Daly's solo songs, but not when she and the others have to sing purposefully off-key. The ending's sweet, but it's difficult to get there. Murmur on the Ornery Express had ambition and a fine setup, but everything feels like an idiot plot. Yeah, scaling the side of a moving train, that's something I've seen my dad do. Planting dill is about the babies now thinking dill's a plant that can grow from the ground, even though the very first thing anyone ever knew about him was where he actually came from. Also, since I had to endure this, you do too. Club Fred is a half-hour romp where the babies attend a crooked pirate-themed resort, with the show starting to run on fumes and this not being a big deal as the season premiere, there was no reason for this to be as long as it was. There's not enough content to sustain its length. A dog's life made Dill Spike's worst enemy. I can't call it good by any measure, even when he saves Dill at the end and gets redeemed, because this is all a shameless reskin of Spike's recounter with Fluffy from back in the day. Such a reskin didn't bode well for one of the first season 6 episodes. Hello Dilly is one of those bad two-for-one deals, where they mix two later editions I don't like together, Dill and the preschool, in a story that's already been done before with smaller, brisker jokes. Who's Taffy? Good question. This is her fourth appearance and I still have no interest in following her. This is more about the babies fearing she's becoming Angelica and vice versa, so it's already like she's a prop. The Great Unknown is the worst of the minute long shorts. They look at a staircase, wonder what the bars are for, and that's it. Something this basic shouldn't be classified as an episode. Angelica's assistant is yet another attempt by them to hype up the preschool spinoff by putting Harold in the House of Pickles. It did the impossible and made me feel bad for Angelica. Harold is just that annoying. Dill Saver is a good example of a new technology episode aging poorly. The babies don't know what a screensaver is and think Dill's stuck in Stu's new computer. Cute at the time, frustrating now that everyone knows what a screensaver is. A Lulu over time was, I believe, their third visit to some sort of old folks' place, and the well had run dry. Ironic for the insanely unrealistic direction this episode goes in. I am folding my arms so hard at the cartoon being cartoony, but the barrel of soap engulfing the entire home is both forced and nonsensical. Age of Aquarium is also just total nonsense with no basis in reality. Admittedly, the aquariums I've been to have been dinky, but this was another weekend activity episode that ended up being really annoying and pointless. Hold the Pickles is an episode about Dill and Taffy. There is zero appeal to me here. And as I've been over, Preschool Days is just a slog of a backdoor pilot. It doesn't bode well for the spin-off that eventually stumbled into production, but I'll question what Baljeet is doing here at a later date. I don't want to give off the age-old impression that old good new bad, even though there's no overlap in my best and worst lists, there's a couple clunkers in the pre-movie seasons that I couldn't fit, and there's a bright spot here and there in the post-movie ones, but I wanted to make it clear how much the quality changed over time and how much of the show was like this. I don't think the show got as bad as Spongebob or the Fairly Odd Parents at their lowest points, but we've got a similar case of how a fall from grace can hurt a show's image. 
and one of the earliest cases from Nickelodeon, but in all three cases, I can still see the love for the earlier years and general brand still pulls through the internet. Rugrats is sadly no longer seen as a hilarious or innovative show, but I don't see the harm in folks thinking of it as charming and nostalgic. It's been so long since Rugrats began that parents who grew up on it have introduced it to their children and hopefully not turned to it for parenting tips. It makes me hopeful more people are checking out the original show over whatever this is. I've checked out a few episodes, and all the changes it made were just done for the sake of change. I don't think it's terrible in a vacuum, it's more Rugrats, but the world doesn't need more Rugrats. We already had a really long show that's still pretty entertaining. If you came to me for a viewing recommendation, stick with the first five seasons and Rugrats in Paris if you want something more grandiose. That's where you're going to get those three magic words that can best describe the series. Simple yet effective. <laughs> We'll be right back.